In this video, we will be discussing alliance centrism and answering a question from the Orbis Debate Forum, one of Politics and Wars Community Servers for Diplomacy. This is the question. Recently, House Stark signed a treaty with Guardian. Has this changed your views on alliance centrism? Additionally, is it possible to have multiple interpretations of the idea? Both House Stark and Hand of Faint are currently among the notable alliances pursuing an alliance-centric policy, but both go about it in a slightly different way, especially in the way they sign treaties. Which, if either, is the ideal way to maintain the policy, or is there a different variation that is best? To answer this big question, let's break it down into smaller ones. What is alliance centrism? Alliance centrism is simply an alliance acting in its own self-interest and dealing with other alliances rather than blocks or coalitions. What is an alliance centric policy? The most well known alliance centric policy is non chaining treaties. I'll use the alliances in the question as an example. House Stark has separate non chaining treaties with the Fighting Pacifists and Guardian. If House Stark is attacked, both of their allies will come to their defense. If the Fighting Pacifists get attacked, then House Stark has to defend them, but Guardian does not. The logic is that if Guardian wanted to defend the Fighting Pacifists, they would sign a treaty with the Fighting Pacifists. Back to the big question. Why would House Stark's new treaty with Guardian worry people? Currently, the game is divided into five teams, also known as spheres. There are almost no treaties between alliances and different spheres. This is because they are all meant to be competing with one another. When an alliance signs a treaty that connects two spheres, it threatens to combine them or cause them to work together. If two spheres start working together, then the other three will unite to oppose them. I will give you one guess what House Stark did. They signed a treaty that connected two spheres and said because it was non-chaining, it is not threatening to all the others. So there are two possible outcomes here. Everyone can copy House Stark and the spheres will dissolve and be replaced by a giant entangled web, or the game can unite to roll Guardian, the fighting pacifists, and House Stark. I guess they could also be ignored, but that would be so underwhelming. Back to the big question. How do House Stark and Hand of Fate go about alliance centrism in different ways? The most obvious difference is Hand of Fate is a fighting alliance, and they've fought a lot of different enemies for different reasons. House Stark doesn't fight that often, and when they do, it's often to help one of their allies. And a Fate fights for its own reasons, and House Stark does not. Another distinction is the Hand of Fate is allied to Grumpy and Cataclysm. They are just outside of a sphere, and unlike House Stark, they are very antagonistic with the allies of their allies. There is a high chance their allies will not defend them. In summary, House Stark is interested in security, whereas Hand of Fate is interested in freedom. So what is the answer to the big question? Uh, I don't know, it's subjective. My answer is the same as Warner's. A year ago he said that Camelot was the best example of alliance centrism. They increased their security with non-chaining treaties, but they did not connect two spheres, and when they fought wars they always had their own goals. If there was a sliding scale between House Stark and Hand of Fate, they'd be closer to Hand of Fate. That said, I'm not going to argue Camelot's the most successful of the three. Most people would say their political strategy is marked by as many defeats as victories. I don't think that's unique to Camelot though. Both Hand of Fate and House Stark are successful in their own right, but the sphere-centric alliances are much more successful. Three examples are Cataclysm, Aurora, and Weebanism. Cataclysm led and merged to spheres. Aurora leapt from sphere to sphere as they got better opportunities, and Weebanism hugged one of the strongest alliances in the game and didn't let go. Oh, and it would be remiss of me not to mention the biggest concern about alliance centrism. If everyone copies House Stark, then you will have a giant web of alliances and treaties. This might make the game more challenging. When you want to attack another alliance, you need to figure out who is going to defend them and plan around that and then that alliance would need to convince alliances they don't have treaties with to help them. So propaganda would be much more important, and there would be much more content. It might do all that. It's possible. 
But if you know anything about human nature, it's not probable. If you can sign a treaty with whoever you want, then people will start spamming treaties to increase their security. And if everyone's too safe, then there will be no wars. Or if every alliance is independent and they don't sign many treaties, then the big alliances will destroy them all one by one. In a world where spheres are the most important thing for security, the spheres get bigger. In a world where alliances are the most important thing for security, the alliances get bigger. And because spheres are more centralized, they can react more quickly to threats. Whereas if one alliance is slowly conquering the game, then it will take months for all the smaller alliances to work together. There are other elements to alliance centrism and alternate foreign policies that are very interesting, but I will save those for another video. If you enjoyed this one, then like, comment, and subscribe. It's free and you can always change your mind later. As usual, I will pin good comments if they add something or if I got something wrong.